Okay, in terms of the stuff. Deadlines are unchangeified. So, uh, exam two, quizzes part three, deadline November 16th, end of day. Exam three, exam four, quizzes part four, December 7th, day of initial epiphany, end of day. For the paper uh, draft deadline, uh, the night, because the uh, Monday veteran, uh, sorry, veterans day, because all, yeah, veterans day, which marks the end, the 11th month, the um, 11th day, 11th month, mark the end of World War I, Armistice Day. They said, we'll never have a war again. <laughs> How'd that work out? Yeah. <laughs> then, um, plus five deadline, number 14th, emergency deadline, number 21st, 50% desperation deadline, December 8th. If you're still looking for paper topics. What did you say after? I was just... Oh, um, so, oh. if you turn in a draft, then you resubmit another one, or the draft can be your final if it doesn't have significant errors? Um, you're, you still have to upload it to the final version of Blackboard, but if you're satisfied with your draft, you could just upload that same paper. I need to say, didn't change a thing, just give me that, that grade. <laughs> yeah, so you, you're, you're obligated to make changes from the draft, but you do have to, for it to be graded, it has to be uploaded to, to Blackboard. Maybe that way that, so that way it's in the, in the thing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, as far as um, the November 9th deadline, um, I know that they're doing, I think, the inauguration. Is that affecting this class? Um, no, so I think the inauguration ends at, doesn't it end at like noon? Yeah, I think, yeah, so I think it's just an convocation. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so, okay. So I think we'll still have it. Paper has to be a Word document, right? It can't be a PDF. Or... Oh, it can be PDF because the the system can handle uh, Word, you know, doc, uh, and PDF. Oh, and then it, if it's other stuff, um, all I'll get is just a thing. Just it says, I'll just get a little little image of a file, and I'll be like, <laughs> zero. <laughs> yeah. So be sure when you're uploading, be sure it's. Um, uh, Word or PDF. If you use something like Open Office, or if you use um, the uh, Mac, what is it like Note or what's, what's the Mac one? Write, I think. You can always just do save, save as. Uh, when in doubt, PDFs, because everything is saved to PDF now. So, yep. good, good approach. Okay, so um, anything else? Okay, you still haven't got a paper topic yet. Um, Couple more, I guess, ideas. Oh, one, I guess it's past Halloween, but one, if you're kind of into like the horror stuff, is to take a particular you know horror creature like ghosts or zombies or vampires, and then apply uh, metaphysics to them. Like, how would you give an account of a particular type of creature based on you know, doing sort of rigorous metaphysics? I'll give a couple of illustrations. Uh, one, of course, we, we saw in class was the application of theory of mind to, to ghosts. So one approach might be if you're interested in ghosts and you want to look at the metaphysics of ghosts, you could look at philosophy of mind and see how such an entity would be plausible given a particular theory of mind. Another example, um, one uh, piece I wrote some years back was called Plato's Werewolf. Because the question would be is how would you come up with a metaphysical account of a werewolf? And we looked at you know, Plato's idea that there are these forms that make everything what they are. And so in order to have a werewolf on Plato's view, what you would have is, and we know from Plato's view, that you can have a blending of quality. So if you have you know, different forms <coughs> instantiated by a particular, they can come in varying degrees. So weird as it sounds, Plato's metaphysics allows for werewolves. Here's, here's how you werewolf Plato style. You know, the form of wolf <laughs> and then you have the form of human and then you'd have a person who instantiates both. And of course, you know, Plato allows for degrees of instantiation, so when they're in human form, they would be, you know, like 99% you know, human. And they would be like a little bit of wolf, you know. That's why, according to werewolf law, 
people who are werewolves have more body hair. Mm -hmm. Also, supposedly, the finger length. Their fingers are all the same length. So if you know if some of the fingers are all the same length, werewolf. Also, of course, you know, vulnerable to silver. And if your fingers are all the same length, I don't tell anyone. Because <laughs> they'll try to like werewolf murder you. And then what would happen is, of course, is the person, when they become like more werewolfy, they'd instantiate more wolf and less human. And so, weird as it sounds, Plato's theory of forms would allow you to explain werewolves. And also various other were creatures like were rats and were marsupials, which are part of the howling movie for real. I mean, they're not real, but they're part of the movie uh, franchise, The Howling. Uh, another um, possible paper topic, if you're into you know, some weird stuff, or like if you want to, especially like food, weird food. As I mentioned before, one thing that scientists have been working on for quite for a while is artificial meat, basically bat grown meat. And the idea is basically what you do, instead of just like having cows roam around making other cows and kill them and make them into hamburger and steak, what they would do is just take, <coughs> say you want to make beef, well you take beef cells and just grow them. Grow them on a slab, you know, if you ever had like a biology class, you probably did a thing with like a little, little Petri dish with the egg armor in it and you put some stuff on it and it grows. Well, you could put on some beef cells, give them nutrients, and they would grow into a slab of, slab of meat. So what would be the purpose of that as opposed to just growing the cow? Well, a couple of reasons. It'll be safe, it'll be safe if you grow the cow. Well, the main reasons for doing it, outside of metaphysics, one is ethical, because that entity is a slab of cells. It doesn't have any feelings, it can't suffer, and so if you're a vegetarian because you're opposed to animal suffering, that entity can, cannot suffer. So it's morally fine to eat because it cannot suffer at all. So if you're worried about like factory farming, the suffering of animals, it solves that problem. Also, the theory is, is that you can grow you know, that meat uh, with less environmental impact and cheaper than growing a cow. Because if you're growing a cow, you're growing all the other stuff too, like eyes and bones and hoofs and skin. You're not just growing meat, <coughs> and so it's less less efficient. So you could grow slabs of meat without all the extra stuff, because you don't eat bones. The world climate too. <laughs> Cheap meats. <laughs> Also, I'll become a vegetarian. <laughs> also, if you want to, um, if you want, you know, we're working towards colonizing Mars. And instead of being able to ship cows, you could just ship cells, and they could make, you know, they could, they could grow. In a clone of cow. Well, yeah, you just you just grow the meat in your, you know, your colony dome because it's too small for cows. That way, you can have some some meats. Now. In terms of how this ties to metaphysics, kind of the question would be, you know, one, I guess, the paper talk would be metaphysical meat, would be, is that meat? meat? You, know, the meta, you know, metaphysics of meat. And so you, the argument would be is, what is it that makes meat meat? Well, in your view is it's got to be, to be properly meat, it's got to be part of a cow. That'd be grown. Even cow. <laughs> so, you can make you know the argument from the standpoint of metaphysics, would that entity be meat? Or would it not? Does as a matter of you know identity, does meat have to come from a living creature? So to be beef, does it have to actually come from a cow? Or could it be could it be grown in the in the vat? I mean if it be multiplied sales. <laughs> now the uh, the meat industry is trying to argue that this is not not meat. Yeah, I agree with. You. Maybe you can, you, if you write a good paper, maybe you could you know get a sell it to them. You'd be the the anti you know you know anti bat meat person. <laughs> get a spokesperson against it. It's metaphysically wrong. Oh, and also some interesting sub issues here would be. If you're a, you know, if someone's a vegan or vegetarian, would this, could you eat bat meat if you're a, if 
Yeah, yeah. thought of that, but yeah, because if, if your view is it's not me, then it'd be okay for the league to be there because it's not no good because the game from the the animal failed. Yeah, you can make the argument that even though it's not me, you'd still argue that it's an animal product or something. Yeah, so yeah. It, they still would need it. But I, my thing is, what is it that? Do you remember how we went over the thing that the glue that holds the cell together, and then so what is it that's holding the tissues together? Oh, the tissues. Well, it's the same thing that holds um, muscle tissue together. Just the they're just stuck together. Yeah, no, that's right. That would be just stuck. <laughs> well, because when, when in your muscle, I mean, the way the our muscles are held together would be the same way. It'd be basically yeah. a muscle just growing on, you know, on a just on just on a a, a pan. Yeah, bone. And now, uh, yeah, so there wouldn't be any bones in there. My mind couldn't let me do that. <laughs> yeah, so you think that it's not me, the, the challenge would be to argue why, you know, from the standpoint. But I mean, what argument you can make is that, uh, kind of like an animal identity thing, to be me, it's got to be coming off an animal that has an identity to it, whereas this has no, no identity. There's nothing, just like, um, if you took human cells and grew a slab on, if you grew a, you know, bunch of human cells on a slab, it would not be, be you know, it wouldn't be a person. It would be human cells, but it wouldn't be a person. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. So you could argue that being proper meat, from the standpoint of metaphysics, requires that it have an animal identity, that it be a cow or a pig, just like a slab of human cells would be human cells, but they wouldn't be a person because they don't have personal identity. So you could argue that a slab of beef cells wouldn't be meat because it lacks cow or pig, you know, in this case cow identity. Now the meat industry, of course, is arguing that it's not meat, but they're not doing it metaphysically. They're doing it legally. Because their argument is, is that, uh, actually if you're interested in metaphysics, you might find some guidance in the legal arguments as to why it's not meat. It's similar to the argument they give as to why um, high fructose corn syrup is not sugar. Although if you're a chemist, high fructose corn syrup is, <coughs> is sugar, by definition. Yes, by definition, it's sugar. Yeah. But the, the definitions in the industry are not set by science. They're set by industry. So another example would be like with milk. Um, soy milk is not actually milk. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's what gets me, especially when I was working at the child they they say, we're going to bring uh, rice milk, mm -hmm. almond milk, and all these other kinds of milk, something like that's not milk. And rice milk is, is, is literally the broth over from boiled rice. And I'm like, and you're going to feed your child that? I mean, your child going to be a demon for sure. Oh, you can eat rice. It's just rice and water. Yeah, but you're going to feed your child rice broth for milk? Oh, you actually, I think... You're not supposed to give young kids. Um, yeah, I think soy milk is. Yeah, you're not supposed to give them, like babies. But yeah, they're not supposed to. Use, uh, the health department has guidelines of what they can have, mm -hmm. but the parents just they don't like it. Mm -hmm. You know, I told them, look, y'all can argue this with the parents, but when the parents bring it, I have to feed their children. <laughs> But uh, then it's the same concept as that. You can't just name something something just to sell it. True. And, and, and that's, 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 that's how they sell it. <laughs> and that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. I guess they. They'll, I guess they'll call it something like you know meat with a Z meats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just like they have, you have, you have cheese <laughs> with a Z <laughs> or cheese product. Yeah. That one. Yeah, so those are a couple um, possible paper ideas. Yeah, if you have a paper topic yet, if you like the uh, horror genre, yeah, there's weirdly enough, there's a lot of opportunities for writing about metaphysics and you know horror creatures, uh, zombies, ghosts, uh, and werewolves. If you need uh, some examples, just do a search. I've written about a lot of these things. You can search my name and a particular creature, and you'll probably find uh, something I've written on on them. That's why I say you look like the should have a lot of. Books I do. Just go on Amazon, type in my name. Just you know, all, that. The, all the things. Yeah, I got like, I don't know, I think I've like, I think like 60 books. 60? 60, yeah. Lots. You 
said 60 or 60? 60, 60, I think. Maybe 70, I don't know. Wow. Tons. <laughs> Lots of stuff. There's not a lot of money in writing. Tell you that. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly enough, so well. Okay, so now we turn to heaven and hell. A place that may be or maybe not. So we now turn to the question of immortality of the soul, namely, what happens after death. We've seen a little bit, a bit of this with the ghost thing, namely, depending on what the mind is, and you die, could your mind keep hanging out here doing stuff? And so yeah, another interesting paper topic would be taking that and developing that more, perhaps in the context of you know, a um, you know, horror movie, because uh, some of the some of the horror movies dealing with the hauntings and stuff do get into the metaphysics of ghosts. A good example is the haunting of, of the um, yeah haunting of Hell House by Richard Matheson. He's a guy that also wrote I Am Legend, the original one. The book is way different from the from the movie, and so um, yeah, you can do look at that. That actually explores like what ghosts could could be, and you can look at the metaphysics of ghosty stuff. Now, of course, another option is, instead of dying and being like stuck here as a ghost badly drawn, you can also avoid the whole ghosty thing and end up in heaven, you know, the whole wings and, you know, part, or you could be in heaven, the little horns and <laughs> wings and pitchforky thing. Lots of roasting. I guess it's handy for the marshmallows. Put those marshmallows on there. And they probably don't have marshmallows in hell because they'd be like, no marshmallows. Why? Because they're going to be high. <laughs> yeah, because marshmallows are nice. Probably only have marshmallows in heaven. So, one question is, you know, do you have a soul? And if you do, can it keep on going as you, after death? Now, one of the, this, of course, has been a question long addressed in philosophy. And one of the people who looked at this was our good dead friend, David Hume especially addressing the question of the immortality of the soul. Now, Hume is Huming within the context of a theory of substance. Now, much like Locke, he doesn't really want to accept substance. He's like, yeah. But for the sake of the discussion and argument, he does embrace it. And so he's working with that assumption that there is material substance and immaterial substance. And with that assumption, he's looking at could that immaterial substance keep on going as you? So a key part of the question is, can the soul keep on going? Well, I guess, is there a soul? And Hume says, okay, for the sake of argument, let's say yeah. And so if you grant that, you may think, aha, once you got that, you got immortality. But of course, as Hume points out, just getting the soul is not enough. Because you could accept there is a soul, but the question is not, does the soul keep on going? The question is, do you keep on going? So if something makes it to heaven, is that still you? Because if something gets there and it's not you, well, you didn't get to heaven. Now, Hume thinks that this is a tough topic, which is kind of an understatement, and he thinks that there are essentially three ways to address that question. Is the soul assuming we get one, is it immortal? And he says there are these three sets of arguments. Metaphysical, moral, and physical. Now he's doing an argument by elimination, which is a you know pretty effective argument to use. And again, there's two basic flavors. There's kind of the Sherlock Holmes view, where you argue by elimination, where you say, for example, there are you know, five possible suspects, and we know one of them did it, you eliminate four of them, who's ever left is going to be guilty. There's also argument to destruction, where you say that there's only, say, three options, none of them can work, so you've got nothing. And what Hume doing is doing is an argument by destruction. He says there's only three ways to argue for immortality of the soul. They all fail, so you're probably not going to. Bad news, probably not going to go to heaven. Good news, probably not going to go to heaven. So kind of a good news, bad news type of scenario. <laughs> so how do the metaphysical arguments go? Now Hume considers you know, the arguments 
pro-immortality, and then tries to refute them. And Hume was, since he's pretty dead, maybe still is, if he's wrong, a uh, skeptic. So his conclusion is not going to be, this is definitely wrong, it's going to be there's really no evidence for it, so you should probably not believe it. But he never comes to a absolutely decisive, you know, there is no soul. Now, like other thinkers, even those who kind of embrace substance, most of them were pretty reluctant about it. They were like, uh, yuck. Uh, they really didn't want to accept it, but saw no other option. And so Hume says, well, okay, let's accept substance. So there's immaterial, ghosty stuff, the soul, and then there's material stuff, physical objects. And like Locke and others have claimed, our notion of this is really confused and imperfect. So it was just a real fuzzy, fuzzy notion. Now, so he begins with sort of a general criticism of the whole thing of substance. He says that's all mysterious and weird and requires all this abstract reasoning and it's just crazy stuff. But for the sake of the argument, let's go, let's say okay. Let's just say, okay, no matter how fuzzy was and weird it is, let's say we've got immaterial substance, immaterial substance. But he says even then, this won't guarantee us immortality. Why not? Well, here's why. Now, he claims, by analogy, that if there is substance, material substance, an immaterial substance would work in basically the same way. So here's how his counter-argument goes. So the claim is, you got the immaterial substance, the soul, it goes, goes forever. So immortality of the soul. But Hume says, well, let's think about this. We also have matter. Now, is matter immortal? Can matter be destroyed? Yeah. No. No, according, at least according to thermodynamics, matter, you know, matter and energy cannot be destroyed, it merely changes form. So matter is effectively eternal, supposedly. Now, but what happens to to matter? It can decay. Yeah, it can decay and it changes forms. So the matter that makes up your body right now. If you know modern physics is right, has always existed, and you know, in one form or another. Uh, for example, at least uh, maybe maybe this is out of date, but the claim is that iron only forms in supernovas. Uh, the claim is is that iron, the iron, iron is only is only formed in supernovas. Mm -hmm. That like the elements that we have have to be forged in you know celestial events. And so the iron in our blood was once part of a star that blew up, just so we could be here. Thank you, star, that blew up, so we could be here, supposedly. Now, so the iron was once part of a star, but of course that star is gone. gone. Now, eventually what will happen to the to your body is, of course, eventually you die. Yeah, you die. And then it decays and it gets reabsorbed, becomes something else. So your material substance is, is immortal. That keeps on, like a million years hence, it will still be, still be around. You're making up something else. But would you say, therefore, that you are immortal because the molecules that make you up are immortal? No, because you're, you're gone. You know, it, it doesn't, you know, someone's saying, oh yeah, you know, all the molecules that make you up will be around forever. It's just a matter. Yeah, you're you're dissipated. Your your body's gone. Now Hume says, by analogy, spiritual substances should work the same way. That they would also, yeah, they they last forever. Let's just say you know they're just like material substance, and they last forever. And he says, by analogy, they have to they would work the same way. So just as your body dissolves and gets recycled, your soul would dissolve and get re recycled the immaterial substance. And so, yeah, you know, a thousand years from now, the little, I guess, soul bits that made up, once made up you, 
would be making up, say, the sole bits of, you know, a squirrel. Well, you wouldn't say, aha, I have a squirrel. But how does he equate the two cults? The planes are different, the spiritual plane and the physical plane. So how do you equate that if the physical plane decays, that the spiritual plane is also going to decay, that the two doesn't add up? Right, you could, I mean, one way to counter them would be to say that, you know, as, as others have argued, is that it could be true that the body dissolves and decays and right. gets broken up that the soul somehow uh, yeah, that it, does, it doesn't it doesn't dissolve. I mean one way it'd be like like Leibniz did is to say the soul has no parts, so it can never it can never break. So your body's made up of all kinds of parts and they all just dissipate. But if the soul is undissipatable, then it would it would never yeah. you know, it would never disintegrate. So it would always be the same soul. But even then, the question would be, does the soul continue to be you? Because as we'll see, like thinkers like John Locke believe you could have the same soul, but not the same person. Uh, to use the analogy, if you have like a flash drive and you have, you know, or take the hard drive on like a laptop, and you're running, you know, Mac OS 10 on it, and then you erase the hard drive and put it in a, Windows machine and install Windows and run Windows, yeah, the drive is still going, but yeah, you know, all the content's gone. So you maybe maybe the soul works like that. And after you die, you know, you get taken off to the celestial factory. God, you know, <laughs> cleans it out and you know, sends it back back down. Yeah, so you could counter counter Hume by saying by trying to break the analogies by saying that the soul is not like matter. It doesn't have parts that can be broken up. So mm -hmm. your your soul is a simple continuing thing. It has no parts to break, so it's always going to be going. Or if it had parts, you could say it, it can never. Be, it doesn't decay. There's no <laughs> there's no decay in, in heaven. Now he does consider the possibility of that it maybe it never can be corrupted. And unlike matter, it never disintegrates. So, this argument goes like this. Suppose we claim that the soul is special, mm -hmm. that it's incorruptible, can never be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so it always, you know, always has been, always, will always will be. Now, Hume makes the following critical assumption or inference that whatever is incorruptible, whatever it cannot end, also must have no beginning. I mean, it's, it's human in a way is not just like making this up himself, because we saw arguments for God would say, you know, God has no beginning and end, because he can never be, you know, well, he has no beginning, so he has no end. And so his connection of, you know, incorruptible and ingenerable, no end, no beginning, is not unique to him. It's what many religious arguments mm -hmm. take. Now, so how does he use that? Well, if the soul can never be destroyed, it's incorruptible, and it also is in general, and there's no, it's always been there, <coughs> that means what? Well, it means we've always been around. around. And Hume asked the obvious question. What do you remember from your previous lives? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> the memory and consciousness is gone. So it may be that your your soul has been around forever, but Hume says since you have no memory or consciousness of, of it, you've not been around forever. Because you know what were you what were you doing in 1901? So how do you separate the two? Either you have or you haven't been around. Well, the soul has been. He, he says, yeah, suppose a soul you know, can't, can't perish. But then he raises the point. But if this were true, you would have past life experiences. You would have memories of, of past lives. 
and you would recall recall them. And if you don't recall them, he claims, then you have no reason to think that that was you. Yeah, maybe your soul goes all the way. If you had like a, you're going back to my kind of fictional, you know, technological or magical things. If you had like a soul trace, of it, either like mm -hmm. a, you know, a, you know, super science thing, you would trace it back, or like a s spell, you know, or a super wizard. <laughs> well, I, I have like a, I guess like a response to that. Like he says, like if the soul soul can't be immortal because we can't remember anything from the past life. But you know how, um, I guess, example of like the video game from Final Fantasy, once you beat the game, like it's, it, you, there's no post-game things, there's no post-game events happening, so you just effectively have to start over, but you overwrite the save file. So. Yeah, you could have, yeah, you could be the gauntest of the video game that you don't keep your yeah, every time you start a new game, you don't get to keep your past experience, your past progress. But it's still the same. Yeah, same player. Yeah. Yeah, you could make that that argument. I mean, Hume would consider that a possibility because he he doesn't say that he's definitely right, but he says if we do claim that our soul has always been, a fair question to ask is, well, what do you remember from past lives? And yeah, you, you could give a plausible reply. I mean, Plato says, you know. Every time you're reborn, your soul gets, you know, your memories get, get, get kind of erased, not perfectly. And if you want to argue for past lives, are the people who claim to have past lives? Are who? Are the people who claim to have past lives? Is it are they? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Shirley MacLaine, one of the most famous, I think she's super dead now. I guess she's on a new life. Is Shirley MacLaine here today? Uh, but she was famous for, uh, a famous actress, but she's probably better known for believing that she had past, past lives. I think. Yeah. And yeah, but then there are people who claim this. And there are some cases where the evidence is not terrible. You know, they, they go and the person has nothing to gain from it, but they seem to know all kinds of things they shouldn't really know at that, at that age, have a depth of understanding of history and events and so forth. But even then, it's um, not entirely conclusive because Anything a researcher could find, like on Google, someone pretending could find on Google. Now, what would be really decisive is if someone, you know, from you know, they're born like in, you know, um, you know, Lima, Ohio, and then at age three they're able to speak ancient Etruscan, you know, and, and write in, you know, <laughs> ancient Greek and talk about, you know, give directions to an ancient, you know, city based on, you know. They show them a map like of, of Egypt and say, yes, there's a city, you know, so many cubits from, from Giza, buried, you know, buried under the sand for the transgressions of the wicked inhabitants. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah, and so if you had, if you had someone you know, doing all this crazy stuff that they, you know, speaking languages they could not have learned in Lima, Ohio, and knowing stuff about the ancient world, you might be inclined to say, yeah, that, that's the devil. <laughs> 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 You might be inclined to say, yeah, that, that's, that person's got that stuff back. And of course, people, there are people who do talk about people having old souls, you know, yeah. on whatever basis. Yeah, and so it's not that there's no evidence. No, one thing I will say is uh, one thing that I like that kind of supports is like the Tibet Book of the Living and Dying. When they talk about reincarnation, it's in a sense of like the same concept of energy can't be destroyed and stuff like that, is that depending on the energy and the positivity that you produce or negativity in this physical world then in the spiritual world you ascend and grow bigger according to that so you can either come back as something and whatever your spirit comes back as is a reflection of what you did in your past life so if you come back as like or ant or something you can do too much but if you come back as like a celestial being and that has symbolism and so listening to this concept just made me think of that and like that, to me, loosely in some ways, can be proven in a way. Yeah, as, as you know, many religions do have reincarnation, mm -hmm. and when people reincarnate, the religions don't say that you remember all the past past stuff. You don't remember. And Plato said you don't remember it unless you're guided. But you don't remember you don't remember particular things like where you used to live. You know stuff about the, the forms. Yeah, so you could. 
you could make the argument that even though there's not perfect evidence for it, there is some evidence for the possibility of this, this occurring. And then there's some philosophers that like, their thing is uh, the point of human existence is to know thyself. Mm -hmm. And so when you take that stance, do you have to consider that idea that you may not know who you were, the specifics of your past life, but so long as you know the intentionality of your spirit, mm -hmm. and that's knowing thyself, and that helps you attain enlightenment and stuff like that. Yeah, because Socrates believed that that's the whole point of giving these multiple lives. That yeah, eventually, yeah, eventually you'll get it. You'll get things right. Get things right. And there are um, um, in fiction, you know, which are kind of arguments by intuition, the cases of people being reborn, and they don't have you know, perfect memories, but they have like skills or inclinations or fears. Uh, for example, people sometimes argue that if someone's terrified of um, a particular like type of death, that it's because they died that way before. They have like a, I mean, everyone's afraid of dying, but they have terror, you know, incredible terror of you know, burning or drowning, and they never were burned or you know, or, or had a bad accident with water. That that was like their previous you know, death. And there are people who feel like they've lived before. They're young kids who do, do seem to have you know, to have like some understanding beyond that of young kids, and. Could be the case that people do get recycled. Yeah, so Hume, even though Hume does make a reasonable point, we don't have conclusive evidence, and uh, we but we don't have none, and so we're in a situation where there's kind of enough reason to think, yeah, this could happen, but not. Like, it's not a case where we all can say, yeah, I remember back when, you know, back in 1901 when we were, you know, doing that that stuff. <coughs> Now, Hume then turns to animals. Now, he kind of goes off, uh, if I was grading his paper, <laughs> I'd say you know, off, off subject. So why does he bring in animals? Well, he doesn't lay out who he's arguing against, but he's probably thinking of Descartes here, who said animals don't have minds, and also in, um, well, in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, do animals get immortality? Typically, no. Although there's some debate about whether animals have, have souls. But traditionally, no. People generally don't go and preach to the dogs. Now, so why does Hume bring in animals? Well, it has nothing to do in a way with the metaphysics of it, uh, about you know, before birth, etc. But it brings it up for the following reason. The people he's arguing against would generally believe that our animals don't have souls. Now, Hume argues here, well, why don't we think animals have souls? Oh, they, they're able to interact with us, they show some degree of intelligence. Yeah, so we think that, if, you know, the reasons we think we have souls are also the reasons we think animals have souls. So the inference should be that either we both got souls, or we both don't. And so his argument is, is not to show animals don't have souls, but his argument is that trying to argue people who think animals Oh. Yeah, so, you know, in a way it's, you know, a good point because, like, as you said, if we think animals, you know, if we think we have souls because we talk and move around and do stuff, we could say the same of animals. And of course, Descartes did address this because he says there's one thing we do that they don't. Well, I think, but the evidence is, that we think, is that we, yeah, we talk, we have true language. Now the next thing he turns to is away from the, the metaphysics, and he thinks to his satisfaction he showed that you probably don't have immortality in the sense of that you keep on going. You know, he does accept that yeah, maybe the soul keeps on, on going. Now, the moral arguments work like this, and these are Back in when Hume was Hume, they really were big on citing stuff. So lots of, lots of plagiarism. Anyway. Aquinas, our good dear friend Tommy Aquinas and others, have argued for after, the afterlife this way. And here's kind of the gist. There is a view that if, you, if people have a desire 
nature to provide a way to satisfy that desire. Now, that doesn't mean that you always get everything you want, but the idea was is that you, anything that you would want in a way, you could somehow get. It doesn't, it doesn't guarantee it, but you don't want things that would be impossible to get, supposedly. Now, one of the things that we crave, according to the, this argument, is ultimate justice, that we want the wicked to be brought low and punished, and the just and virtuous to be exalted, and raised up and praised. But when we look at the world, are the wicked always brought low? You know? mm -hmm. Are the just and virtuous always exalted? Mm -hmm. No, so we don't see true justice here. We see the wicked exalted and the just brought low. But we have this passion, this thirst, this craving for justice, and we don't get it here. So, if we don't have desires that cannot be fulfilled, that means our desire for justice must be satisfied. It's not satisfied here, so it means there must be an afterlife in which true justice is dispensed, in which the wicked are punished and the good are rewarded. Therefore, the reasoning goes, there must be an afterlife to ensure that our thirst for justice is satisfied with the beer of justice. Well, and that's the only reason he can conclude that there must be an afterlife because uh, justice must prevail. Well, it's not Hume's argument. This is what he's going to argue against. Oh, okay. So there are people like Tommy Aquinas and some others think it's not their only argument, but they do make the argument that you know, we, we crave true justice, the only way that could exist is if there's an afterlife, therefore there must be an afterlife. So Hume thinks this do argument doesn't work. Why not? Well, he kind of picks it apart piece by piece. First is this. Now, the punishment and reward are pretty extreme. How so? Well, basically he gives the following moral option. I just wanted to clarify. You said Hume doesn't believe in the sentence judgment that made. Right, yeah. Because he, he's basically, basically the argument he's going against is the one I gave, which is, you know, we really, we crave justice. We don't get true just, justice here, but in order for our, our thirst for justice to be satisfied, there has to be an afterlife where it is satisfied. So there must be an afterlife. And Hume says basically good effort, but, but no. And here's, here's his arguments. The first argument is about, uh, well, kind of the problem of evil type of deal in, in God's power. Now, if, and this relies on you know, a big assumption, if God makes everything happen, if, you know, God creates the world, he causes everything, and that's the view taken by Spinoza and Leibniz, then there can be no object of punishment for God. So, well, here's my usual bizarre example. <clears throat> so you got a kid uh, playing with three, uh, two dolls and an action figure, or three <coughs> action figures, depending on how you break it up. So they get a Barbie, they got a Ken doll with action sweater, and that's what Ken has got, and he's got G.I. Joe with a Kung Fu quote. And then he's like, the person's saying, you know, um, Barbie's like saying to Ken, Ken, you don't satisfy me anymore. I'm, I'm, I've been hanging out with G.I. Joe because he's got a Kung Fu grip. And you know, he got the, he's like, yeah, that's right, Ken. And then, you know, look at this Ken, a Kung Fu you right in the face. <laughs> he kills Ken, throws him off at Barbie Greenhouse. And then Barbie and Ken, like Bar uh, Ken and um, G.I. Joe go off and live in sin the rest of their life with all the money they stole from Ken. And then the, then the person takes, you know, oh, Ken, oh, uh, Barbie and G.I. Joe, they, they crash the Barbie dream car and they die. And of course, he throws them onto the barbecue. Of course, they burn in hell. Poosh. Now, is the kid's punishment of G.I. Joe and Barbie just and fair? Throwing them onto the barbecue of hell? He created a scenario. So, <coughs> is this, if he believes it's fair, then it's fair. Does he create the scenario? Right, but why do Barbie and G.I. Joe have their torrent affair? Who makes that happen? The kid, so he's the one that should be on the on the barbecue. What is what a sister does? Comes over and knocks him out of the barbecue. Oh, sinner, you must burn. 
harsh times. Yeah, because if, if he's making the dolls do all the stuff, kung fu grip and you know murder and stuff, then he's making it happen. I mean, the dolls are just dolls. They have no agency. Throwing them on the fire um, punishes them not because they didn't. They cannot do otherwise. They're not in control. It'd be, it'd be stupid. And so, if God is you know making everything happen, Hume's argument is there's no one for God to punish because if people commit sin or murder, they're doing that because God makes them commit you know sin and murder. And so, to take someone like you know. Go and okay, you're going to go and commit some murders and sins, and then I'm going to punish you. Be like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> you know, and that would be unjust. You know, to use an analogy, if someone like grabs your hand and like punches someone else in the face, and then calls for the police and says, "Oh, that person assaulted them," that would be unjust. And so God is like grabbing people and saying, "You know, why you're why you're hitting yourself?" Now, of course, there's a way to counter that, which is what. They, that they had, a, they made the choice. Like they that, that they made the choice. Yeah, that they were making the, the choice that instead of just you know action figures that have no thoughts, if they if the person you know made you know three AI toys, you know AI Barbie, AI Ken, and AI um, GI Joe, and then left them alone, and then came back and like, what are you doing? <laughs> Stop. It. And then you know then took them. Yeah, you know they. You know, he finds, you know, A.I. Ken murdered, his sweater torn to pieces, poor Ken in the sweater. And he takes, you know, the Barbie and G.I. Joe A.I.s and throws them in the barbecue. Then he could say, if he, if he gave him rules, said, okay, I don't want you killing each other. They lay that out pretty clearly. No, no adultery, no murder. Or, you see the barbecue over there? You got to be extra crispy. <laughs> then he could say, yeah, in that case, that would be fair because they were warned and they had a yeah. choice. Yeah, so if God warns us, and we have free will, then the punishment could be yeah. just. So, but of course he's got more argument. So, again, kind of his first argument is, is that there's no reason to have, the, the argument for justice doesn't work because there's no, if God's running the show, there's nobody to punish because God's doing it all. And of course the counter is, <laughs> the sneeze game. Kind of the uh, you know, the uh, you know kind of free will choice argument. Now he also makes an argument about the extent of punishment, which is, well, how long is hell supposed to last? Eternity. Yeah, you know, how bad is it supposed to be? The worst. Yeah, yeah the infinitely bad. Infinitely bad for infinite time. And of course, heaven is supposed to be infinitely good for infinite time. Now, one concern is is that the proportion of punishment. Because the idea is, if the assumption is the afterlife is eternal, permanent punishment. Eternal reward or eternal punishment. And Hume says, there's no offense that someone could do here on Earth in a finite amount of time that would be infinitely bad that merits infinite punishment for an infinite time. You simply couldn't do enough, even if you did evil from like day zero to the end of your days, you couldn't do enough evil to merit infinite punishment for infinite time. Even if you just eviled all the time. Eventually you hit a point where, you know, it's okay, you're, you're, the person was evil, super evil for you know, 35 years, mega evil. Well, eventually you, you'd run out of, you know, 35 years of mega punishment. You're like, well, anything more would be unjust. Now there's a couple ways to reply. One could be, that Hume is assuming, you know, permanent hell, permanent heaven. Maybe there's, maybe it doesn't work that way. Maybe a person does like their time in hell, they're, then they're like, did you? <laughs> okay, it's my time up now. Yeah, did you? Yeah, <laughs> and they check, they get another, maybe they get another chance. I'm like with their incarnation, you get another chance. And if you get it right this time, you you get rewarded. And then maybe you get to screw it up again. Or maybe, maybe eventually everyone gets heaven, because eventually people will, you know, after an infinite amount of time, even the worst person works out all of their... But that contradicts what he said earlier. If you've been warned that, okay, if you do this, then this is a reward. Just like, I mean, 
they balance out each other. I mean, if you do right and do just, you have infinite <laughs> amount of paradise. But we but don't. Not, we don't. You have infinite amount of. All right, but we when we when we punish people here, we don't we don't make the death penalty for everything. We don't say you know you jaywalk death penalty. You know you um, tear the tag off the mattress death penalty. So he would probably say that even if you warn people, you know infinite. You know, hell okay. is still, still, still. If, if I kill somebody, they say you kill them, then you get the death penalty. I'm gone. Mm -hmm. I, I'm finished. Now, God is saying the wages of sin, boom, yeah, is death. Yeah, you can make an argument that we Yeah, were. so he, he warned you. Yeah, you can say you get infinite punishment, you do, you get infinite. Yeah, I mean, you, you, it's, it's, it, it, again, he's going against what he's already said. So, to me, that would cancel out what he's saying now. Well, another way to, to accept it for punishment, I'll close with this. Um, there's a preacher called uh, Edwards. He, was a, he wrote the famous uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he argued for infinite damnation. And his reasoning was... God is infinitely good, so any crime against God is infinitely bad, no matter mm -hmm. how small. So the least of sins is as bad as the worst of sins, mm -hmm. and all deserve infinite punishment. And so if you have that view, you could justify infinite punishment. And, yeah. But again, Hume's argument is, is that the kind of punishment that's infinite, we, th <coughs> we think that would be unjust. And so the argument that we have to have an afterlife so we can punish forever, Seems problematic. <coughs> so we close. Okay, so next time, more infinite punishment. I mean, more. <laughs>